Welcome to Sooner Saucers, Oklahoma UFOs from 1947 to 1969. I'm Marilyn Hudson, and I wrote the book on Oklahoma saucers. Seriously. When I began to look at the entire subject of UFOs and Oklahoma, I was amazed at how few stories there really were. There were a few stories. There were a lot of big myths. And there was a lot of just emptiness in the landscape, in the newspapers, in people's memories. So what I began to do was I began to look for those stories. And I was also curious then because of the, some of the things that were coming to light about Project Blue Book, that uh, it'd be nice to be able to actually look at those cases and investigate them and see what they were, uh, see how they uh, presented themselves and not through a third party medium. So I began to do that. Digitally, I was able to find them online and I began to look through the cases that related to Oklahoma. It was fascinating. It was frustrating. And mostly it led to a lot of understanding of just how big and how important and maybe how secretive the entire subject of UFOs had been. Before Roswell here in Oklahoma, there was a case in June of 1947 in Yukon, Oklahoma. A farm family looked up into the blue sky and saw this. They described it as an upside down wash tub. And in that time and in that context, a wash tub was a usually metallic, galvanized steel, sometimes porcelain cover, but mostly galvanized steel. And it was that shininess of a metallic looking something that caught their attention as they saw several of these zipping across the sky high and fast. July 12, 1947 in Tulsa, were the top cases out of the files of Oklahoma stories. There was a World War II veteran taking photographs in Tulsa. And that person happened to glance up and took a picture of eight objects that he saw going across the sky, across downtown Tulsa. He snapped that picture. And sure enough, when the photograph was published in the paper, you could actually see those strange round objects. What were they? Were they weather balloons? Were they aircraft? Were they something else entirely? In the 1950s, there was a lot that was going on. The government was very anxiously moving into some top secret kinds of work. They had uh, super secret projects, uh, spy craft going on right and left. And sure enough, over Oklahoma, there were some interesting cases as a result. One of them was in 1956, right over Oklahoma City. Now, what made this in interesting was the fact that several people witnessed this object and all over the state similar objects were seen. Now this object moved both horizontally and vertically. Now it could be described that well that could be a balloon, uh, it could be a balloon that lost some of its air, it could be, it could be but the fact was that the object was seen moving into the West, even though the final report will change that witness statement and make it moving into the Northwest so that it will conform to weather patterns and things that were going on as they attempted to find an explanation for this sighting. Now, if you'll notice a very, a lot of detail here there were lights that were seen all around the edge of the object. 
It had a glow to it. It was all those standard aspects that we're so familiar with when it comes to the topic of seeing something in the sky that is unusual. Now, another one from 1961 was during a almost 10 day period in Northern Texas and Southern Oklahoma. There were reports of objects always looking very much like this, football shaped, slightly squished, moving usually in tandem with others. And they moved north, south, east, west. And they were seen by people such as the uh, radio uh, newscaster who was returning home, who sketched the, these images, and his wife. But meanwhile, down in Texas, very similar descriptions and sketches were coming up from people who were seeing them down around Shepherd Field in Texas, Wichita Falls, and other places south of the Red River. Now, you could, if you squinted, you might look at that and think, oh, those are like afterburners on a jet. But given the fact that they were moving in ways and speeds and heights that were very unfamiliar in 1961, the question does remain, were they actually planes? Were they something else? Now, 1965, I call the summer of the saucers. It was an exciting period of time. And for most of the people in the Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas area, it's an invisible event. We know a few things that happened. In fact, if you do a Google search today and you look for big UFO stories of 1965, the only one that comes up is one in December, the Kecksburg UFO. But oddly, some of the most important UFO stories actually came from the summer period in 1965. The United States government would claim that it was all a widespread Great Plains temperature inversion event. But the truth was that in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Sydney, Nebraska, all across Oklahoma, all across northern Texas, there were people who were seeing dozens, dozens of mysterious craft flying in ways that caught their attention and made them stop and look. From the, from the Air Force's own files, there were over a hundred airmen and army servicemen who gave testimony in that Cheyenne, Wyoming, Sydney, Nebraska event that was a part of the same time period. They saw no one could explain them. Everywhere that they were seen, the same story emerged. Now, when you look for, as I did, the stories of Oklahoma during this wonderful summer of 65, you'd expect to see just lots and lots of files. Well, there is a small, meager file. But most of it is there because of a private civilian individual by the name of Hayden C. Hughes, who was the leader of a uh, UFO organization in Oklahoma at the time. And he was hot on the trail. He was first feet on the ground there to write down the information, record the information. He was there in the uh, Oklahoma Highway Department's uh, communication center. So he was getting the information firsthand. And that's the only reason that I think that there is that large file in the Oklahoma files is because the fact that Hayden C. Hughes was a good patriotic young man and he typed up a report and sent it to the Air Force. He saw himself working in partnership with the Air Force. Unfortunately, they did not have the same feeling. The real files for Oklahoma are found in a 300 some page file labeled Monkey, Louisiana. And one 
for a Nevada case in Carson City. Those files are both over 100 page long, it's nearly 200 pages for the Nevada one, 300 and something for the Bunky, Louisiana cases. All stories, all cases containing the information from Oklahoma. Why? Because they were seeing the same thing in those areas. They were trying to coordinate how they were going to explain what was being seen. In one, in that funky Louisiana file, there is a communication that was typed up that went to the Pentagon, to NORAD, the Air Force headquarters that indicated that there was a landing at Spencer, Oklahoma of an object that was on the ground for a half an hour, that they had received over 200 reports of objects in the air, and they all confirmed to the exact same description and maneuvers and directions. Now that totally flies in the face of the story that the Air Force will present in just a few hours as they try to explain away all that happened during the summer of 65. Uh, they put out first thing, thinking only of the Wyoming cases, that what was seen was Jupiter, stars. Well, unfortunately, the men in charge of the planetarium in Oklahoma City heard that read that in the paper and just shook their head in wonder and bewilderment because as they explained to the newsman those stars and those planets are on the other side of the planet at this time of year there's no way that the air force is correct where did they get their information well then quickly double doubling back back pacing the Air Force was able to come up with the idea that, well, no, 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 that just referred to Wyoming because they would have seen different things, ignoring the fact that the same stellar objects that would be visible in Wyoming would also be visible over Oklahoma. So then they turned around and there was a huge multi-state Great Plains temperature inversion and that was what had caused it. All the people were seeing was reflections of other aircraft, even though they could never win pin down tell when and where those aircraft were. Nobody could find ample evidence of those aircraft that were being reflected in so many different ways across the state skies of Oklahoma. Now, one of the most important pictures of that summer was this one right here, taken by a 14-year-old boy in Tulsa. Now, some people were quick to uh, label it a hoax. It uh, looked a lot like a kind of a light that was used to light up Christmas trees during the time period. Uh, but, and that it, uh, some people accused that it didn't look like any of the reports filed. Well, unfortunately, all of those were both true and untrue. It did look a little bit like a lighting machine that was used to uh, circulate colors. But it did also look like many reports that had been filed with the Air Force and are visible and findable in Project Blue Book. Now, the other thing is that the Project Blue Book file contains dozens of attempts of the Air Force to try and duplicate this picture. They had the big black cloth, they had the big lighting scope there, and none of the pictures that are contained in that file match this picture. Now, just the next year, now if you'll notice, if you'll remember across looking across all the uh, high points of UFO sightings in history. Uh, they're all in a kind of a three-year cycle. There's a building up year, a high point year, and then a falling down year that sometimes will have really more cases than the peak period. That's the way it was in 1966. 
you had a big period in 65, you had a lot of sightings, a lot of news, a lot of noise. And then in 1966, over here in Tulsa, there was a civilian air patrol unit, several cadets, and they saw objects in the sky. They filled in the report, they sent it in, and the Air Force very quickly said they had seen aircraft. Now, if you look at the report closely and you read just that cover sheet, as is so often the case, the cover sheet presents a different perspective than the facts in the file. And that was the case with this one. With this one, the cadets said, yes, we saw these lights and they were moving across the sky. And that's where the Air Force stopped. Inside the file was also this sketch that said the rest of the story. Yes, we saw these objects moving into the sky and then we saw them move into this black object and they disappeared into it. And the black object blanked out the stars in the sky. So the rest of the story was lost and the narrative was changed. It was a mothership? Just what was it that they saw that day? in 1966. Now, compare that and that mothership concept to what we see here from March 1966, Temple, Oklahoma. This is a story that actually got in Heineck's book. Uh, he mislabeled it as Temple, Texas. And so the story was really pretty well hidden again uh, because of that mistake. Uh, but an engineer at uh, Wichita Falls at Shepherd Field uh, was driving down from his home in Oklahoma to go to Fort Wichita Falls to go to work. And he and Trucker and several other drivers observed this strange object in the sky. And um, this person saw the object as he was coming around the bend in the road and it was off to the side, and he saw it, and he was able to give a very detailed description of it, and he even saw an occupant. The occupant was very strangely dressed in what looked like coveralls, kind of the uh, mechanic kind of outfit that we're familiar with, and even a baseball style hat. And as you can see, it has some very interesting and intriguing aspects. It uh, appears to be football shaped. It was about 75 feet long and about 12 feet tall. And he thought probably about eight feet wide. It was metallic and shiny. And it had a very, very interesting window in it. Now this, this design, uh, keep that in mind because in future stories and in my volume two that I'm working on right now. There are some other stories uh, from Oklahoma that nobody knew about that also had some very interesting visual effects like this. And I'll look forward to sharing those with you. Now, one of the last cases in Oklahoma was one that uh, actually had a call from Dr. Heinick. Um, he talked by phone with the witnesses and it was over in Rocky, Oklahoma, just south of what was then the Burns Flat Air Force Base, the Sherman Clinton Air Force Base at Burns Flat, Oklahoma. So just south of there was Rocky. Now the file, when I first opened it up, uh, to be honest, I almost just laid it aside because of the way it was worded. Uh, two kids, two boys had seen something and they had described it and called it in. And it made it sound like it was just a couple of little elementary age children who had seen something. But determined to you know, collect as much information as I could about these stories, I delved into it a little deeper. And lo and behold, the boys were actually a 17-year-old and his cousin, who was 29, 
Now, those boys might seem boys to a grizzly haired old military officer, but to me, those were young men. And what they were doing was they were out at four o'clock in the morning delivering hay into a barn that you see in that picture there. Uh, they were working for a local farmer and they were delivering hay to his barn and they were doing it early in the day so they could avoid the heat. And sure enough, as they were doing that, they saw to the, in the distance, as they depicted and showed in the picture that was taken by the Air Force, they saw the object about right here, and it will move upward and across like this, and it's covered with lights, bright lights, and they're moving around. They seem to be rotating, and that's what kind of drew their attention first. At first, I thought maybe it was a helicopter. They were used to seeing those kinds of things being just north of the air base, and so they stopped, and they looked, and then they realized that it was not a helicopter, it wasn't a plane, and that there was something about those flickering and rotating lights that was just really bizarre. So they continued to watch it for a, a little bit, and then they went inside. Now, he will, Heineck will call these gentlemen, and he has a transcript of one of his conversations with the younger young man. And they seemed to be very honest, very sincere. They weren't out to get anything. I mean, given the fact that this story doesn't appear in any newspapers I was able to locate, uh, you know, they weren't doing anything for uh, get their name in print. They had seen something, they recorded it, and that was it. Now, the Air Force report does contain some interesting things. One of them was that there was a great deal of interest in radioactive readings. They were very concerned. In fact, a special uh, communication went out to uh, an area that was the expertise, the experts in the radioactive recording and gathering of, of those readings to determine just you know what kind of uh, tests they needed to run, what was safe, what was not safe, you know, just how should they proceed. Now, given the fact that there were some other accidents that the Air Force had been involved in containing uh, uh, involving radioactive materials, it may have been just a new level of security and a new level of care was being taken. But maybe there was something else that was also going on that they did not know about, that they weren't willing to share. And so that becomes one of the last cases in Project Blue Book related to Oklahoma. Now here's a sneak peek from my book that's coming out, Volume 2 of the Sooner Saucers. Uh, this actually happened right here in Stroud, Oklahoma, where I live. Uh, it was uh, sent to me by an individual who uh, was first-hand witness. Uh, she and her entire street and family saw this. There was this, a group of objects that came in almost like a, a string of pearls that came in. Each one was a different color and then they stopped and they moved around and they rotating. She said it was like a carnival ride and they watched it for the longest time and then they took off resuming in that, ch that chain formation. And it was just a very fascinating story. And so I'm looking forward to to uh, sharing a little bit more about that uh, in volume two. Other projects that I have that are coming up, this is the uh, advertisements and the mandatory. <laughs> I have two monographs that I'm finishing up right now. One is 1947, Those Saucy Saucers, it's a chronological listing of uh, sightings, and The Summer of the Saucers, another chronological listing. I have a theory that says that one of the problems that we've had in historically looking at cases in UFO history is the fact that we tend to focus. Uh, we have stories here in Oklahoma, and to really get the understanding of what was going on, I've often had to trace those out into events going on in other states elsewhere. 
to see the same object being reported in other places. And the lack of that kind of contextual broadening that I've seen in a lot of the, the stories, uh, I think is a detriment. And we need to be really uh, open to seeing where the stories take us and learning as much as possible. I have a contact form on my, my webpage, UFO Skies, where I view articles and question things that have happened. Uh, and there's the uh, link for it. And I also have an email, Marilyn A. Hudson at yahoo.com. Feel free, please uh, contact me. Share, me, share your stories with me, and I'll be more than happy to put them in volume two or in any others. I'm also working on a book on the Kansas sightings and I will share my own personal experiences in that one. So I look forward to uh, hearing from each one of you. And thank you so much for allowing me to be with you and to share with you Sooner Saucers. Thank you. <laughs>